Well, I'm not sure if I can actually add much to that. It has been a blessing. It truly has. You know what? Why don't we just right now start with a word of prayer? Why don't we approach God's throne of grace once again? Father in heaven, Father, as we come before your throne again, Father, we come in thanksgiving, thanking you for this wonderful day, thanking you for the opportunity to baptize Heather and Daniel and Michael into the family of God. Father, we thank you for the way that you continue to work in each and every one of our lives. And Father, that will be our discussion today. So I ask that you will take the lead, Father, that you will speak through me, that I will be not be seen nor heard, but that you will be glorified and Jesus will be lifted. And so I ask these things in his mighty name. Amen. This Sabbath, we're, we're continuing on a set of thoughts in a series that we started, I believe, two weeks ago. Pastor Frank, the past two weeks, he preached on revival and he preached on, on reformation. And I'm not sure if you, were, if you were seeing it in the bulletin, but we put a, a very small quote from Ellen White in the bulletin and it ran through the month of January before we started. And I'd like to share that with you right now. She writes this in Review and Herald, March 22nd, 1887, just a few years ago. She writes, a revival of true what? A revival of true godliness among us is not something that we need, right? What does she write? It's the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs. To seek this should be what? To seek this to seek a revival of true godliness should be our first work. Does that place some importance on having a godly, living a godly life, having a godly character? Does that place any importance on it whatsoever? I would think it places a great deal of importance, right? And Pastor Frank shared, if you remember, he gave us on his first one on revival, he gave us a rather extensive list, a long list, of qualifications for us that would show us or tell us that we were in need of spiritual revival. Do you remember those? Some of them were that we stopped caring about those around us, that sin reigns in our lives. and that we don't have a heart for people. Those are some of the larger ones, but there are, the list is quite extensive as to why in each of our lives we need a spiritual revival. And the quote by Ellen White doesn't say, there are those among you. She says it's a greatest of our needs, that spiritual revival is of our needs. It's something that we all need. And I hope that as you looked at that list, that you couldn't find yourself in each one of those categories listed. But I'm willing to guess if we took a hard look, that there would be probably more than one for which we would qualify. And so that tells us that we need something in our lives. When I think about the word revival, what what does revival mean to you? You can answer out. You You know how this goes. I'm going to ask questions. You can shout out answers. What is a revival? A bringing back to life, right? It's perhaps something that you had in the past, but that's faded away. And now it's time that we need to revive you. We might need to restore you. But as I was looking at definitions, there was one that really struck struck me and caught my eye. It said that revival is is a restorative process that brings something back to its true nature and its true purpose. That's a revival as well. And I believe that's what we need in each of our lives. We need, in the Christian's life, revival is going to be restorative. We're We're going to do this in two parts. Revival and reformation. I want to read another quote to you. But I first want to say this, revival is in fact a restorative function, the desire, the plan, the intention, the hope 
of someone returning to their true nature and purpose. She goes on. We're going to combine them for a moment, then we're going to split them back apart. Review and Herald, February 25, 1902. A revival and a reformation must take place under the ministration of whom? A revival and a reformation will only happen through the Holy Spirit. Revival and reformation are exactly the same, right? She writes, no, they're very different. They're two completely different things. Revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of mind and heart, a resurrection from what? From spiritual death. Is that where we find ourselves spiritually dead? Because for that, we absolutely need a revival. Reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas and theories, habits and practices. Reformation will not bring forth the good fruits of righteousness unless, unless what? It is connected with the revival of the Holy Spirit. Revival and reformation are to do their appointed work, and in doing this, they must blend. So the simple fact of the matter is, you can't have reformation without revival, and revival doesn't stop by simply being awake or awakened. There's a continuation that must happen. And isn't that what the Lord is trying to do in each and every one of us? To waken us, to change our lives, to remold us, to reshape us, to bring us back to our true nature and purpose. Isn't that his, hasn't that been his intention and his purpose since Adam? I believe it has. Isn't that, weren't we created for a purpose? And he wants to bring us back to his image. We had three baptisms. And, and Daniel, Daniel shared something that was, it was actually quite striking. That God works through each and every one of us. And Daniel shared that. It was, he believed that he was touched by all of you in the interactions for VBS. And these words, these words, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Can you, the Lord says that to us each day, doesn't he? I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Each time we go to bed, each time I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. I don't want you to be out of my presence. I'd like to start right in. I'd like to jump in to the concept of revival. And I want to start, we're actually going to focus, both this week and next week, we're going to focus on two verses. And those verses can be found in Romans because I think they epitomize revival, and reformation when combined together. If you turn with me to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, and we're going to start right in verse 1, and just a foreshadowing, next week we're going to focus on verse 2. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Paul writes this, and this is something that I've been reflecting on for a long time. Paul's words, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, what? A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Sometimes we get caught up in the words. I haven't used beseech much recently. I might ask, urge you, ask you, something like that. And so as we're working through some of these, I included another version. I include the Amplified Bible. And anything that's parenthetical or bracketed is added for understanding. And so from the Amplified Version, it says, there, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, and then in brackets, dedicating all of yourselves set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, and intelligent act of worship. A living sacrifice. Before I go on, I want to skip to one other verse. We're going to go to Galatians 2, 20. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. 
Again, Paul writing. Galatians 2 and chapter 20. Paul writes this. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives where? Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, the life that I'm living right here, right now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Sister Irma shared in her, in her prayer how much she appreciates the sacrifice that Christ gave us the atoning blood from the cross. Again, we'll, we'll skip to the next. I, I have it in the Amplified as well. And it reads this way. I have been crucified with Christ. That is, in him I have shared in his crucifixion. Doesn't mean Paul was crucified on the cross, but he shares in that crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith, in parentheses, by adhering to, relying on, and completely trusting in whom? Completely trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay, Paul, Paul is using in some wonderful imagery here to describe his experience but he's also using it to speak to his audience. We know that Paul was a Jew. We knew that many of the converts at that time were of Jewish descent. And he needs to make an impact on them in his writings. So the Jew in the first century, an Israelite from the first century, would have complete understanding of what a sacrifice would be. He would have a very good understanding of the crucifixion because many of them might have seen it. And they understood in some part, if not in large part, what the sacrificial system was to accomplish and what it was instituted to achieve. Now at the time, there were three, pass three not three Passovers, but three festivals that were considered pilgrimage festivals. Jesus, when he went to the temple for the first time, that was at the time of, recall? Passover, right? At the time of Passover. The second one would have been the time of Pentecost, which would be Shavuot. James, if I've said that wrong, please excuse me. <laughs> and the third one would have been Sukkot, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, five days after Yom Kippur. And he's using an imagery that they would have understood and terms that they would have understood. And the moment that he said them, it would have painted a picture in their minds because they've been through these things. And you might ask, I say this is about revival. Presenting a living sacrifice is about revival. With the baptisms today, the baptism is not the start of someone's spiritual journey, is it? No, it's simply the outward expression of something that has been happening in, in people's lives for a period of time. And in that same way, you are not going to present a living sacrifice or a sacrifice in any capacity without some prompting from the Holy Spirit and an understanding of what you're doing. And so as he's talking about sacrifices to a group of people that understand the system, Sister Irma shared that it wasn't you just went out into the field and you just found a cute little lamb and then you walked into the sanctuary unbeknownst to anyone. No, there was, there was a process to this. And it was quite public. And if you gave it much thought, if you were there superficially or just to follow an ordinance, you'd be embarrassed. But if you were there for the right reasons because you had, understand, you had understood what sin was, and you understand now what sin is, it's a redemptive process. It's a restorative process. It's bringing you back. But why was, this, why was the sacrificial system instituted? Was it simply to, quote-unquote, deal with sin? Was it simply so that a bunch of animals would lose their lives so that blood would flow from the sanctuary? 
No, it had, a, it had a great deal more to it. But if we turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 1 and verse 11, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 11, right in the beginning of the book, Isaiah writes something that's quite profound. And it's not just Isaiah speaking, it's the Lord speaking to his people. He says this to, the Lord says this, To what purpose is the multitudes of your sacrifices to me? Why are you sacrificing? I have had enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. If we go on to the Amplified Version... It says this, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me? What is this supposed to mean to me? In brackets, without your repentance. Why are you here? I've had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of cattle without your obedience. And I take no pleasure in the the blood of bulls or rams or goats offered without repentance. Why was the sacrificial system instituted? It had a purpose. And it wasn't just to have burnt offerings or to decimate the population of lambs and of goats. And it speaks to intent and to desire, and that has to be something that we consider in these things. The real efficacy in the system was not in the sacrifice, but in the intent of the sacrifice. It was, if it was offered without thought, if you didn't care, if it didn't matter, it meant nothing. You were simply performing a function. But the real purpose was to understand that sin costs something and not just to continue in that path, but to look to change. That was sin's purpose. Excuse me, that was the sacrificial system's purpose. To help, to prick the heart, to have people understand, to revive you from where you were to where you didn't want to continue doing that anymore. To pull you out of the spiritual lethargy. Hebrews 8, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. Paul speaks again the words of Jeremiah 31. And he writes this, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because, why? Because, Carlos said it, because they didn't remain faithful. They didn't keep, their, keep up their end of the bargain. And they didn't continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put what? I'll put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. And then the words that he's spoken so many times, and I will be their God and they will be my people. Many times I've heard it said, well, there's the old covenant, and then there's the new covenant. The old covenant was just about sacrifices, and the new covenant is just about grace. But my question to you is this. Reading what Paul wrote in Hebrews, do you see a difference in the covenants? What was the purpose of the, I, I said it, what was the purpose of the sacrificial system was to prick your heart and draw you closer to the Lord. The entire purpose was for God to be your God and for us to be his people. How does that sound any different than the new covenant? where he wants to put the laws in our hearts and in our minds, and he wants to be our God, and he he wants us to be his people. Sounds awfully close to me. The reality is his desire has always been the same. 
God's desire didn't change from the days of Adam until now. He wants us to put away sin. He wants us to have a spiritual awakening. And Hebrews 12, 24 says that Jesus will be the mediator of the new covenant. That is the, the insurance poly for that one. One of the beautiful things is that God doesn't change. What he said yesterday is the same as today, and it's going to be the same as tomorrow, and you can bank on it, and I can bank on it. Another quote from Ellen White, Christian Service, page 44. And I don't share this to shock anybody. I don't share it to point fingers, but simply to, to show where we sit and the state of things. She writes this, Today, a large part of those who compose our congregations are what? They're dead in trespasses and sins. And she's including herself in that. Our congregations are dead in trespasses and sin. They come and go like the door upon its hinges. Their spiritual walk is an up and down cycle all the time. A revival and then a sliding. A revival and a sliding. A revival and a sliding. For years they have complacently listened to the most solemn, soul-stirring truths. But they have not put them into practice. Revival and what? Reformation. You are revived, and then you do nothing about it. I'm revived, and I do nothing about it. And this cycle continues. Therefore, they are less and less sensible of the preciousness of truth. As I hear it over and over, it becomes to prick my heart less and less because it's a message that I've heard and I've done nothing about. While they are making a profession, I am a child of God, I am a disciple of Jesus, they deny, or deny the power of godliness. If they continue in this state, God will what? God will reject them. They are unfitting themselves to be members of his family. On whom does this burden lay? Who is making the decision? Again, like the covenants, God is upholding his end of things. He is waking us from that spiritual darkness, from that spiritual death. And then when the time comes, we decide, eh, not that big a deal. And then he'll do it again. And then I just don't worry about it so much. Those precious truths that I hear, I let them go. Until finally a point, the precious truth never really makes an impact anymore. And little by little, I'm unfitting myself to be members of God's family to be a member of God's family. You know, there is, and sister, I'm not sure if you've heard it, but there has been talk within the medical community about resuscitations, about trying to revive people back to life. And the discussion has sounded a little bit like this. Because we have such low numbers of success, why are we doing it at all? Because we, we sometimes are doing a great deal of damage in the process, should we stop the process of trying to revive people? Should we, and I'm talking about CPR. If you don't, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. When, when someone's heart stops, as medical professionals, our, our job is to assess and then begin CPR to try and sustain them until either the heart comes back to life and the body spontaneous circulation starts again or until a time goes by and, and we're unable to do any more. And the discussion is whether that's even a good thing anymore. Because if you look at the, if you check the metrics on it and look at the actual percentages of people that survive CPR, you'd be surprised at the numbers. If you're in a hospital setting, if you have the resources of a hospital, it's about low 20s percentage. If, you're, if you don't have those resources, it's right around 10%. 
And so medical professionals are saying, and the problem is, is that when we do CPR, many times there's damage done. We're, we're saving a life hoping that, that we didn't create too much damage in the process. And so the discussion is, is it worth it? Is it, worth us to, is it worth it to even begin the process? Or are we better off, because the numbers are so low, just to do nothing? That's a tough decision, isn't it? Having the knowledge and the possibility to save someone's life, the decision is simply being based on, is it worth it? We've got such low numbers. And I thank God... I thank God that he doesn't have his metrics the way that we do. Because if that was the case, I'm certainly no one's judge, and I don't, in, I don't intend to do that. But by the things that I read and the things that I hear and the things that I see, I'm afraid that his numbers of life-saving work might be a little bit low. And he doesn't just say, you know what? They're not worth it. Because even one life is worth it to Jesus. One life he would have died for one person to save them and to bring them into his family for eternity. And so for him, it's not, eh, it's just not worth it. My numbers aren't high enough. If I could just get a few more percentage points out of the deal, I would consider saving them. No, that's not the way that he takes it. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite. If we look into, if we just take a few points of scripture, in Joshua 1.5, he says, I will not fail you or abandon you. He says, I'm not, I, I, I'm going to uphold my end of the bargain regardless. And I'm not going to leave you. Isaiah 49.15. This is a beautiful picture of his care for us. Can a woman forget her nursing child? How many women can forget that they have a child if you've had one? Anybody? Is it, or simply just not important anymore? Ah, they've been too much trouble. I got some smiles out of it, so I'm guessing that's not your attitude. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they will forget yet I will not forget you. I will be here for you through thick and thin. And then Matthew 28, 20. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Even, unfortunately, for those of you that choose not to be with me for eternity, I'm still with you. And I'm still wooing you. I'm still pulling you. I'm still working to bring you out of spiritual lethargy. I'm still putting forth the same effort that I did all those years ago. I still want you with me forever. And I'm not changing. That will not change. And so as Paul writes, back to that verse right in the beginning, Romans 12, 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, my brothers and sisters, that you, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. To everyone who understood Paul's words at that time, the only sacrifices they knew about was a dead sacrifice. And Paul is challenging them. He's saying, that's not what he's looking for. And they would have also understood that the sacrifice that is being requested is for everything. It's not a piece of you here and a piece of you there. It's for body, mind, soul, it's everything. It is a complete sacrifice. Holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your, in the Amplified, your reasonable, your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. 
in every way presents yourself as a living sacrifice through your thoughts, through your actions, through everything that is. Present yourself to God. And let him revive you. Let him restore you. Let him return you to the original design and the original purpose. That's, that's the intention. That's his desire. And isn't that what we want? Or do we want something different? Because if we do, you know, if we ask for forgiveness for something and yet we have no intention of ever changing, no intention of stopping, no intention of Anything but my desire is our request a reasonable request. Because along with forgiveness become, comes repentance, right? You need to turn away from it. And that's what we'll look at next week. Revival this week. Next week we're going to talk about Reformation. And the verse we want to center on will be this. Romans 12, 2, because Paul continued on. And Paul says this, and do not be what? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. There's intentionality in revival and reformation. There is desire in revival and reformation. It's coming through the work of the Holy Spirit. But we have to be willing to be a part of it. God will do his part. He says, I will not abandon you. And in the end, we will be remade into his character. Reformation, uh, I was thinking about it. It's, it's sometimes, it's, it's, not a, it's a positive connotation. The word has a positive connotation. But it can have a negative one as well. Reformation is something that's going to take time. It's going to take intentionality, but more than that, it's going to take the Lord's Spirit to do it. And the promise is that he will uphold his end of the bargain. And that walk that goes up and down, that 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 surge, that what looks like a sine wave, will stop. It will have a constant upward movement. will stop slipping into spiritual, it's a tough thing to say, spiritual death. Lethargy is spiritual death. And that's not the Lord's desire for us. And we don't have to have things that way. But the beautiful thing, like I said, he's not looking at the metrics, he's looking at what we can be and what he wants us to become. So bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven. Father, as we continue this walk with you, we want to thank you for the way that you've been instrumental in each and every one of our lives. Because you continue to call out to us. You continue to prick our hearts. You continue to call us to, to more and to higher. Father, your desire is to revive us. And then you want to change us for the better, for the much, much better. And so it's my prayer that you will continue to speak to us, that you will continue to guide us, that you will continue to set our feet on the path that you would have us take. And Father, when we have hesitation, take that from us. Continue to speak to us. Because there's one destination that I believe we all, we all wish to share. And that's eternity together. So be with us, I pray. And we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.